Hi, welcome to the Cows Podcast. I'm your host, Hunter Burney. A catalyst is defined as a person or thing that precipitates an event. A catalyst is something that it participates in a reaction, but does not get consumed in the reaction. There's a heart behind this podcast for, you know, people with aspirations. There's a heart behind this podcast for motivated people that want to make a difference, that have a bias for action, that really truly want to be a catalyst in the environment around them, both professionally and personally, in their homes, in their workplace, and beyond. So welcome to this podcast. I really hope you're enjoying the series that we're in. Welcome to this episode, and let's dive right in. Hey, welcome back to the Catalyst Podcast. We are in the Transformation Series, and we're here with Rachel Stander. Um, If you haven't listened to the first segment, definitely go uh, catch that because we're going to hop right back into the story. I, I kind of interrupted her uh, in, in a sense mid story because I think uh, there's some great takeaways from you know what we're talking about here and, and hearing her journey. So uh, just to hop right back in, you know, a couple of my major takeaways from what you were just sharing. Um, number one, it was a process, right, for to make that leap. But there's a couple of key things that you described that I think are are very valuable. Um, for anybody that is, is, feels like they have a pull inside of them, whether it's personal or professional, uh, to, to kind of add value to the market in a different way than what they are right now. One is you started taking acting classes in New York before you made the move to the West coast. And, and to me, that's completely logical and, you know, just a very smart litmus test for, Hey, there's something practical that I can do to scratch this itch and, and kind of validate um, in a sense and, and kind of a soft entry in, in, is the way I kind of perceived that. The second thing that stood out was um, that you, uh, I don't know, what was that? Sorry. Um, the second thing that stood out to me was, was making the move um, you, you really like, if you're willing to bet on yourself and, and you have that confidence and you're willing to get uncomfortable, that growth will be there. And kind of like you were ending there in the, in the last segment, um, you know, you, you didn't want to regret not doing it. And so I appreciate that. That was, you know, just kind of a really cool, um, narrative there. And, and I think there's a couple major takeaways among others. Appreciate you sharing that. Absolutely. So, I do want to kind of catch up to current state. So your producer uh, with your company, A Season of Rain, and this scrap feature film is, is kind of your big project right now. Um, how does transformation, and kind of give us a little bit about the, the, the summary of, of the movie and, and share how transformation kind of ties in to uh, the plot. Absolutely, yeah. So scrap is you know, it's a feature film, an independent feature film. It's about an adult brother and sister who are estranged. Um, And then their life circumstances force them back into one another's lives. And (laughs) I'm going to, sounds like I'm an advertisement for your, for your podcast. Uh, Their their life circumstances are a catalyst for reconciliation. (laughs) Hey, I'll, I'll support that. <laughs> they, um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm doing a terrible job describing the plot because I'm so distracted thinking about transformation and, and, and what's happening with these people in this story. So at the beginning of the story, um, the sister, Beth, it, she's just lost her job. She is been evicted. She's living out of her car. Um, and, you know, she sort of starts the story from a place of trying her very best to maintain appearances. Um, she has this sort of growing chasm between her reality and the things she is presenting to the world and also trying to trick herself into believing is still going on for her. Um, you know, for her, there's really this this divide between appearances and, and truth. And she 
is clinging desperately <laughs> to appearances. Mm -hmm. um, and for her, you know, her journey over the course of the story is, 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 is one of getting back into alignment with, with truth and her reality and accepting her reality as it is so that she can then move forward and find happiness because for her sort of like that, that tension, that friction between the, the way she told herself her life was going to look mm -hmm. and the reality of what is actually going on in her life, it's insurmountable. And, mm -hmm. um, and she has to sort of, you know, figure out a way to, 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 to reconcile those two things in order mm -hmm. to, to find a path to her own happiness. And, it, you know, over the course of the film, she does, um, you, you know, it's, it's, it's not like rainbows and unicorns at the end, but it is hopeful. It is a hopeful end for her at the end of the story. And then her, her brother, Ben, he has sort of a parallel thing going on again, where he had this idea for himself about what his life was going to be. He's a, he's a writer, he's a husband, he, he and his wife are doing IVF. They're trying to start a family. And he certainly has these ideas about, you know, who he is and what he will spend his life doing. He will be a father. He will be, you know, a certain kind of novelist. And, um, and the actual reality that he's living is not those things. Mm -hmm. And he has to come to terms with his reality again, just like his sister in order to sort of find a way to find happiness in that reality. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, both of them are starting in, you know, denial or avoidance of their circumstances. Okay. And um, over the course of the story with one another's help, really, I think probably seeing seeing what is going on with the other one you know helps them deal with their own stuff um to to find that way forward nice and how how did you come up with the title the title well i did not i can't take okay. credit for the okay. title right. <laughs> the writer vivian kerr um, came up with it and you, she, she's talked about it a little because people are very curious about this title. Right. Um, there wasn't, there was briefly an alternate title, which was pride. Okay. Um, but you know, she, she's talked about the word scrap and the various meanings. So, you know, as a, as a noun, you know, the sort of like the leftovers, the little bit that, you know, remains, mm -hmm. um, as an, adjective you know to be scrappy mm -hmm. to be you know to like make 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 it work with whatever mm -hmm. you've got um and then also to the verb to scrap you know she and her brother go at it um mm -hmm. and they're yeah so i think she she really likes that that there's room for interpretation room for yeah. seeing it through different lenses but all of them sort of fit these people and their in their story yeah wow that's super interesting no i think and, and i come from a manufacturing background i'm not uh I'm, I'm in the tech space now but uh scrap to me is is like a physical like you're saying leftovers uh, right like you use up a certain amount of material and then uh, there was a scrap so i was curious um no, i like that that's cool but i think to, i mean you know that is probably the first meaning that I think of when I think of it as well. But that's so, you know, I mean, Beth, her character is dealing with that. And, and even, you know, somebody, you know, having scraps is like all you get in life at some point, but also she herself sort of feels like a scrap. She feels like a leftover in, in her life or in the relationships that she's trying to navigate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so it, you know, there, it's an ambiguous title, but I think yeah. intentionally, intentionally. So, yeah, I mean, I think it draws, um, like you're saying, it's kind of room for interpretation and it's going to draw some curiosity. 
Uh, that's cool. So what is the process? Like how long is, um, is this a 12 month thing? Is it a 24 month <laughs> thing? I, I don't, I'm, I'm completely ignorant to, you know, what yeah. this might look like. I'm curious. So our process is, it's, it's, the story of scrap it started as a short film um okay. and a, a 20 minute short film which in the world of short films is actually quite long okay. um but it was essentially the first you know roughly with some changes t- the first 20 minutes of what has become the feature and we shot that in 2018 um as a proof of concept for the story and the characters. And then we, you know, so it got shot in 2018 post and got finished. And then 2019 did the festival circuit with that proof of concept short. Um, Mm. So that was like a year. (laughs) And Mm. during that year, you know, seeing the feedback and, and what was, you know, what was resonating with audiences at these festivals, Mm. um, Vivian, realized okay there is an appetite for this and so she went out and she she completed the story she wrote the full feature script and Mm -hmm. you know that was developed and worked on and went through um you know reader feedback and getting coverage and um and you know to to get the script really well developed and into really good shape before we you know were like set with that and and then we moved into financing which we've been working on that for you know we've done a six-month campaign on WeFunder, which is an equity crowdfunding platform okay um which was you know we heard about WeFunder because we had a friend who had done it for for her feature film we'd never heard about it previously we were familiar with um donation-based crowdfunding, Mm -hmm. but never the equity crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. We had not seen that as a model. And it was, you know, it was really interesting to us because it's, it gives the investors, I mean, they're investors, right? They're not Mm -hmm. donors. They are investing in the film and in us and the concept and, you know, believing that it's not just a good story that deserves to be told, but that it's also, you know, a good business model and Mm -hmm. that what we're (laughs) doing is you know that there's a good possibility of recoupment and profit um and so you know that'll be wrapping up shortly in end of april and then um and then we move into pre-production and then production our our production window is going to be about four weeks of shooting in los angeles okay and then there's post-production which can take you know, four, six, nine months, depending on how quickly you do it, how, how much you are able to demand sort of like the full-time focus of the people who are working Mm. on it, doing Mm. the editing, doing the sound mix, the coloring. Um, And then, so once you have your like finished film, (laughs) then you move into distribution, pursuing distribution. So for us, our plan is um, we would like a festival premiere at one mm-hmm. of the major festivals in the US. And then, you know, we'll be working with a sales agent to pursue distribution. Um, and then depending on how that goes, the timeline for actual distribution might be out of our hands. If, it, if, if there's a buyout, then it's up to the distributor to decide exhibition timeline. Mm-hmm. Um, but we expect it will be available in some form for viewing in 2022, mm-hmm. either in some limited theatrical release or streaming or both. Yeah. Wow. What I'm curious, what is the ecosystem um, for where these would be distributed to like who, where you would be able to actually view it? Cause I, I know that last year uh, at least, I live in a decent sized suburb suburb and we only have one major theater and, and they're closing their doors forever. Oh, are um, they? Yeah. And, but you know, being not too far from Nashville, I know there's at least one very popular, uh, I think it's called Belcourt theater. Um, you know, that, that has a, a very strong following and, and, um, production cadence for uh, indie films. So it, I, I'm just curious what what the trend is these days with 
kind of where that would be distributed? Right. Well, you know, of course the trends are remains to be seen a little bit, how they'll be affected after COVID. I mean, we just got news that um, one of our beloved theaters, the Arclight theater in, in Los Angeles is Mm -hmm. not reopening, which is like, people are so sad. (laughs) So sad. We'll see if like somebody swoops in and buys it, but um, you know, that's sort of like selfishly sad. It's, it's a beautiful theater and it's one of these ones where you can like reserve your seats online and they sell gourmet hot dogs <laughs> to like, perfect. This is exactly the movie going experience I wanted. Yeah. But no, our, th- our film, um, it, you know, in terms of a theatrical distribution would most likely be, um, you know, a limited release. So they start in like LA and New York at like four or five theaters for, mm-hmm. for a weekend, two weekends, see how that goes. And then they'll expand into, you know, six, seven, eight more cities. So it's one of these, you know, they, they do it as a slow build because word of mouth is going to get butts in seats. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reviews, you know, good reviews get mm-hmm. butts in seats. And mm-hmm. so they can, you know, they, they do a slow rollout on a film like ours because the, those things will happen. Right. You just kind of have <laughs> um, to it's not, it's natural... not, yeah. It's not like a film where they sort of release it to as many theaters as, as they possibly can on the first weekend because it, they need to get as many butts and seats as they can before word gets out. Ours is, right. you know, uh, I would like to think, and I expect that the, when the word gets out, it will draw people to the theater. Yeah, yeah. It's so they do. Growth. Yeah, um, and then you know, so it's it's going to be like the smaller theaters. I mean, Lemley is a good chain for indie indie films, um, mm-hmm. and then you know, like the neighborhood theaters where it's you're going to have an experience um, that's a little more intimate maybe than like the, the giant theaters, Um, which I think is, I don't know. I mean, I like that kind of experience when I go to the movies. I remember one of the, one of my favorite movie going experiences. (laughs) I went and saw with my sister, we went and saw this movie called a simple plan, which I don't, I don't know if you know it. It's like Uh, Billy Bob Thornton and it's um, I think, oh gosh, I hope that's true. No, I'm not sure. Yeah, I wish I could. I, oh you. man, I shouldn't have said that. I, I'm pretty sure it's him. It's um, it's like this. It's it's a movie where like things just start to go wrong and they just keep getting worse. Okay. And we saw it in this theater, and there were like it was the middle of the day. It was like seven people maybe in the theater. Clearly, I barely remember the movie, but I remember the experience of watching it with like these seven strangers in a big dark room dead silence except for like like, audible gasping every few minutes as like things were happening and like that kind of an experience where it's quiet and intimate and like you know you you remember it if it's like it's living in your body yeah I I I think that's fun I think that's if we can give that to people um and you know obviously the genre is very different but you know to give people sort of that communal safe transformative experience Mm -hmm. I think that's exciting yeah no that's cool and I I think yeah I'm anxious to see um I think that'll continue like post whatever you want to refer to this last uh several months as you know to have something that is a different experience right because I think people have gotten so used to the mainstream stuff, being able to, you know, click a button. I mean, I've, I've got a daughter who we watch the same thing on Netflix and Disney plus over and over and over. Right. And, and it's just on demand and um, it's not really, it becomes not an experience, you know, it, it mm-hmm. just um, becomes a little more of a commodity. And I think, yeah, I think that what you, what you're describing is uh, definitely more of a, of an overall experience. And just for clarification, it's, it's Billy Bob Thornton, Bridget Fonda, and Bill Paxton. Bill Paxton, yeah. Cover. Yeah, so you know. It's them. a great, okay, good. Well, I'm glad I didn't like totally <laughs> m- m- mistake that one. No, it's a, it. It's such a good film. It's very, 
it's good. It's good. I highly recommend it. (laughs) Thank you for being a part of this journey. Definitely subscribe and like. Check out Be A Catalyst on Instagram and on Twitter. Also, don't forget to check out the YouTube channel where you'll find videos in addition to the Catalyst podcast recordings that give a little bit more context around my heart for training, my heart for seeing early to middle managers and and first-time leaders really thrive and, and be a catalyst in the organization that they're in, in the project that they are after, everything that goes along with that. So thank you for being a part of this. Tune in for the next episode and remember, be you, be confident, be a catalyst.